Welcome to the Enroute series from Salt Fox, Neil Taylor. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Nia Taylor Clark is the founder of Black Lit, and I'm so excited she's here with us today because there's so much to learn from her. Her story is absolutely wild. It's inspiring. It's motivating, and I really hope that you can get a lot from her story and what she's doing right now, and some really big news of her expansion of her business and what's to come. So, Nia, what is Black Lit? Hi everybody. Um, my name is Nia Taylor Clark, and I'm a mom. I'm a teacher, and books are my love language. But as I was teaching, I realized that a lot of students cannot say the same thing because of a lack of representation. Um, they don't really see themselves as readers. So I decided to start Black Lit, which is a monthly subscription box that highlights Black authors and entrepreneurs. So what is Black Lit, and then who is Black Lit? So I named it Black Lit to stand for Black and Literate because I had students tell me out of their own mouth, "I don't read, Miss. I'm Black," and I was I was shocked. I was just like, "Okay, this is my first year teaching. I've been in the classroom for less than a month, but I got a problem to solve." And so I wanted to remind my students that yes, you're black, but you can also be literate, and it's not a bad thing. It's a pretty cool thing, and there are、mm-hmm. a bunch of black authors、um, that you can read to get you excited. There are a bunch of black-owned businesses that you can shop so that you can feel seen and you can feel like you belong. And so Black Lit is just a reminder for students that they are black, literate, empowered, and strong. And I take that back, not just for students, because sometimes parents need that reminder. Because maybe、right. when they were a student, they didn't feel that way. So now that they're adults, they don't read. So Black Lit is just a celebration of Black literature. It's a reminder that yes, we're Black, but we too can be literate. We can be empowered. We can be strong. And we want to educate you. If you're not Black, come read these Black books. Like Black authors, they're for everybody. They're not exclusive. Like. We've been reading white books for years and years and years.、Yes. It would not hurt for you to grab a black one. And so, Black Lit is just a community of learners and readers with open arms to embrace those who love to read, of course. But even if you don't, try a Black Lit box and give us the chance to try to change your mind a little bit. Forty <laughs> percent of our subscribers are not black. Like Black Lit also serves as an educational tool. We include like discussion prompts in there, and questions to get you talking about these issues. And yes, it, it's it's not exclusive. It's just a celebration, and there's nothing wrong with celebrating a group of people that deserve it, just like you do. What is inside a Black Lit subscription box? You'll get a book, of course.、Um, you'll get a T-shirt.、Um, Some of them are like this, like we have books in my love language, or and other fun sayings that promote literacy. You also get three to five products from different Black-owned businesses. You get a bookmark,、um, and then you get the discussion questions that I talked about. But yeah, every month it's a different experience. You told、yeah. me that one of your inspiration is from one of your students who said, "Miss, I don't read,"、um, mm-hmm. and so you had another. Inspirational point too, right? In DC, at a restaurant. Yes, and so after that student said that, I went to、uh, Bus Boys and Poets、um, in Washington DC to visit my family at home, and I walk in and I see my first children's book with a black character. Mind you, I already like to read, and so I was just like starstruck, like this exists. Like I just like to read because. My mom had books everywhere, but now I got. I, I started to understand why that little boy thought I don't read because we'd never seen it before. And my son, he was a couple months old, and I was just like, I need to fix this now. And so I had my biggest wildest dreams on, and I was just like, Oh, I'm gonna open up a bookstore tomorrow. <laughs> nah, not gonna happen. <laughs> Can't afford it. Don't have a building. None of that stuff.、Mm-hmm. And so I. Doing my research,、um, and I settled on subscription boxes 
because I wanted it to be more accessible. Like this way, I'm bringing the books to my students. They don't, their parents don't have to drive them to the bookstore. Here, here's the book for you kind of thing. We're in every state except for Maine. So if you live in Maine, please buy a black lip box so I can say I'm in all 50 states. Um, but, and we're in six countries and that would have oh never- gosh. congratulations. Thank you if I didn't go the subscription box route. That's just really amazing in, in how you have changed from this dream, this epiphany, this moment of um, just like you were in like La La Land, like in the sense of like, you're like, wow, this is like a dream come true, right? It's like a fantasy almost. And then it all kind of came together for you. And you're like, okay, this should be an e-commerce business. <laughs> that is pretty dope. <laughs> like it took me a minute to even think of myself as a business owner. I used to introduce Blackly as my passion project, to be honest. Oh. I was like paying for each Black Lit box sent out rather than profiting off of it because no, I don't have a business background. I didn't have um, parents who started businesses. Um, so what I did was I found mentors and that really turned me into a business owner because that gave me access to information I didn't have. And so people underestimate the power of representation when in fact, I didn't even see myself as being capable of being a business owner because I've never seen anyone that looks like me being a business owner. Yeah. And so it took organizations like The Deck and um, Impact Ventures really showing me people that looked like me and really coming up to me and letting me know like, this is not just a passion project. This is a business. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It, it just totally warms my heart because I, I, for you to be super real and honest about what happened at the very, very beginning. And I think a lot of minority women too go through a lot of similar things. Um, it's, you know, it's almost like downplaying what you're doing when you're really doing the big thing for you to have students as well who are, who looks up to you you know whether you know you're just a teacher for you know one semester for them or a whole year or something like that they're always going to remember you <laughs> they're going to be like this lady <laughs> nia taylor clark <laughs> yeah, she changed my life when i tell them i have a business they're just like what but you're a teacher <laughs> And they don't, yeah. they don't see like the possibilities. Like, yeah, you can be a student, but you can also do this. Like some of my students in my class have even started working on businesses. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. Like, I'm so proud of you. And I just, you never know. Like when you don't see things like growing, when I was in school, I didn't have a black teacher that was an entrepreneur. So I didn't know, like, right. so. Yeah. And yeah, no one I'm, in your family was an entrepreneur too, right? No, no one in my immediate family was an entrepreneur. My mom thought I was going crazy. You hear me? Like, <laughs> yeah, like rogue, absolutely rogue. Like, I think you need like maybe print out a picture of like Oprah or something that you were featured yeah. on and just like, hey, maybe have that on a shirt and just like wear it every day. <laughs> like, mom, mom I was featured, I featured on Oprah. <laughs> She's hard to convince because she knows about Oprah and she's still like, <laughs> you want to do what now? Like, Talk to me problem. about that a little bit with um, the whole Oprah thing that changed your business. Like that was just a complete pivot in your business, like overnight. I was working so hard in my business and teaching and trying to mom that I didn't even see Oprah reach out to me. I didn't see the email. I completely missed it in my inbox. I couldn't respond to give my interview. And I just, I thank God that they thought enough of Black Lit to just go to the website and use the information that was available and to still feature us. Because I would have missed the opportunity. I didn't oh know. Goodness. I didn't know I was in Oprah till almost a month after I was in Oprah. And here's how it worked for me. I typed in top book subscription boxes, clicked on the first link on Google, and it was Oprah Daily. So I'm scrolling, <laughs> scroll past one, I scroll past two, I get to three and see my face. It was 1230 in the morning and I made all the noise in the world. <laughs> I called my teacher friend like, girl, you need to get on the computer. I think I'm in Oprah. I don't know if it's a typo, but we made it, okay? <laughs> And what was so significant for me was 
that same week I had quit my job, but it was during COVID and I had to choose between sending my son back to school or staying home with my son. And so I took a chance. I stepped out on faith and less than seven days later, I found out I was featured in Oprah. And so I found out the next day I sent it to my mom and she like posted on Facebook. (laughs) And when I tell you, I went from a hundred subscribers to over 500 subscribers Mm -hmm. and it was, it was a blessing, but it also came with growing pains that people don't realize. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was fulfilling orders one by one by myself in my apartment. At this time, I didn't have access to all of the wholesale pricing because I didn't have that many subscribers. I couldn't get like a business loan or anything because my business was new. And so that's on the business side of things. But then there's the emotional and the mental um, challenges of being an entrepreneur. Like to me, I was just like, I've had this business now for about eight months. I tried to ship out all those boxes on my own. And when I tell you, like it got so real so fast. I ran out of products. I was late on shipping orders. I didn't have a team, so I couldn't answer all of the customer service inquiries in less than 24 hours like I had been doing. It was just like, what is this? What did I sign up for? And do I need to go get my job back? Because (laughs) I don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) That was a big, that was a big learning moment for me. I will never, I will never forget that experience. (laughs) What made you get up? Like, was it just the adrenaline? Was it the orders, you know, keep on coming through, like new subscribers or customer service? They were like, where's my order kind of thing? When I started this business, I made up in my mind that Blacklit is bigger than me. Mm. And every time I want to quit, I go back to that student. I go back to that little girl I turned into when I seen that book. I turn to the left and look at my son. Like, how am I supposed to explain? Yes, I'm used to have a business, but mommy quit. Like, he is watching this process in real life. And so I have to see it through. Blacklit didn't get this far because I knew everything. I'm so grateful for my mentors who have reminded me that basketball wasn't always easy for me. Teaching wasn't always easy for me motherhood definitely still is not easy for me. And I'm willing to stick those things out. And so I just made a decision to believe in myself enough to keep going. So where did your passion for reading come from? You're a basketball player and you had some accessibility to books due to your mom. Um, But like, where did you um, get into the whole reading side of things? My parents didn't force reading on me. My dad and his mom, they used to read the same book and talk about it. And I'm just like, y'all are so corny, but I want to talk too. Like, can I get in on the conversation? And so that made me curious. And then I was not a big talker as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so a book for me felt like a conversation in a world that I knew nothing about. How did you begin your entrepreneur journey? Did you bootstrap or receive working capital? I used my teaching salary, which we all know is a very little. So what I did to start my business, I bought about 20 books by black authors off of Amazon. I bought a table from Walmart and a tablecloth, and I signed up for a vendor event. And I put them all on the table I also made some t-shirts. I ordered about 20 t-shirts, 20 books. I'm like, if I just sell 20, you know, that that's enough. And I ordered a sample of what I wanted the black lit box to look like. Just one, because I was too scared to order any more. Of course. And I went to a vendor event and I set the box on the table in the corner and I just stood there with my shirts and books. And I just stood behind my table and I just looked. And surprisingly, people came over and it it blew my mind. And they were just so happy to see these books. Like they didn't have to wait till Black History Month to go right. to store and see them on the shelves. They didn't have to go search high and low or 
ask someone who works in the store, like, hey, are there any books by Black authors? And feel ashamed. No, it was right here in their face. And just watching them appreciate it, let me know that buying those 20 books on Amazon with my teaching salary was a good choice. And so I started doing that a couple times a month, two to three times a month, I would find a vendor event and I would go set up. And I counted how many times people asked me, what was that to my black lip box? I just wanted to see if anybody was curious, like, right. do they care? Do they just want the books? Do they want more? That That's how I started. I would use my teaching salary and I learned I shouldn't have probably done this for my mentor, but I used my own money, my own time. And the best part is my child was right next to me the entire time. And so he got to see it all. And that's how Blacklist started. No, no fancy loan, no fancy investor, just an idea. <laughs> I, I did not know it at the time. Like at the time I thought, oh, books, let's give books to people. But when I look back, it's like, it's so much bigger than books. It's so much bigger. It's, it's so much bigger than just creating your own schedule. Like we yeah. literally change lives with these businesses and break generational curses with these businesses and generational cycles are coming to an end. Like it, it's important. And I, I'm so happy I was able to see entrepreneurship as less of something that everyone needs to be afraid of or needs to wait for permission to experience. Oh, absolutely. And something that is worth just going to get it. <laughs> going to get it, just fighting. Yeah. So being in the business for three years now, what have been your largest hurdles? One of my biggest hurdles have been separating my emotions from business. Because when I was, when orders were late for Christmas, because I was at over capacity, I was like distraught. I was just like, oh my goodness. Like I, I was just so upset. My emotions were tied into it. Or I'm going to be honest. Like I've had some people walk up to me and tell me I don't belong in certain rooms or like sell my business to them. And if I don't, they'll get another black girl to be the face and do the exact same thing. Wait, wait, wait. That I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait one second. So someone came up to you. To my face. Asked to buy it. I said your no. Your business. Asked Black to buy man. your business. I said no. And he's like, think about your son. And I'm like, oh, oh. maybe I should think about my son. Like, am I doing the right thing? And I said no. Like, okay, because I know I need to do more research. I don't even know how this selling the business thing works. And he goes, well. Don't be mad when I get another black girl and do the exact same thing because you don't have enough money for this. Oh. And I was just like, I, when I tell you I was distraught, like, d like, like, just like done, like walked out in like tears, didn't want to return. That was a, that has been one of my biggest hurdles is separating the emotional part that comes with this because I had the black lip box and even some people attack the black lip box like you're this is not um, promoting unity. This is promoting separation. Um, would, wouldn't you consider this box being racist because you're leaving right, out like other the houses? whole black lives matter versus the all lives matter conversation and mm -hmm. conversations like that bother me. And another hurdle besides the emotional weight of being an entrepreneur is dealing with the very problem that I'm trying to solve, like the lack of representation and the lack of access. I'm trying to solve those problems in my box, but there's a lack of access and representation for the products I'm trying to get in my box. So I'm trying to buy items at wholesale prices, but there aren't a lot of books. Yes. I would go to the wholesale website to order books. And if I wanted to choose a book by a white author, I would have 50,000 options. Yeah. But no, I need specifically books by black authors. I only have a couple to choose from. Mind you, I send three different books every month. So I'm like running through books like it's nothing. Or these books cost more than books by white authors, which is not fair. Like, and it's just, 
it's it's been a journey dealing with those but what i learned is that where there's a will there's a way isn't to... that the most like crazy thing that comes to your head though is that when you're like faced with all these issues that wouldn't have for you know more on the average you know the average joe it's mm-hmm. like it, it's almost like oh my gosh like someone before me has tried to do something similar like what you're trying to do and how much more like problems they had go through when society back in that day too wasn't as um welcoming as today i guess is the best way and pc way to put it (laughs) (laughs) it's mind-blowing i sat down with another subscription box owner a white woman she pays three dollars or less for all the books that go in her box never have i ever got a book to go in that box for three dollars out like never hey, well it sounds like with the um upcoming bookstore maybe this is a possibility to branch out and be the wholesale yes. i'm so i'm so so so, so <laughs> excited about that the black lit bookstore is i'm so excited about it it's it's just going to be a cultural hub where we get to do exactly what we do in the box once a month every single day and people get to come and experience it for themselves they get to shop these black owned businesses they get to see black authors they get to meet with book clubs they just get to feel comfortable in their own skin that that's the easiest way to put it and i think that's one of the biggest things um that blacklit has done for me as a person is i now feel so much more comfortable in my own skin um just after seeing all these black authors, because even though I like to read, I haven't even, I didn't read some of these, half of these books I included because I didn't know they existed, but now I'm learning too. Mm-hmm. Or even the black owned businesses, it's just like, wow. Like, I'm so proud of this skin now. Like, I, I'm just like, I love it here. Like, that's the simplest way I can put it. I, I love it here. As hard <laughs> as it is, I love it here. <laughs> but I mean, the challenge is what kind of gets you going, right? And yeah. You know, I think it's it's now that you have gone through this, you know, this isn't like the first month of your business. You know, you've been doing this for now three years and it's to the point where you're like, OK, I now know where to kind of um, not necessarily like bend the rules, but, you know, where to kind of navigate, you know, to mm-hmm. maybe open up other opportunities that maybe haven't been tackled completely yet. And I yeah. think that's something that's really inspiring, which means that as an entrepreneur, you're always innovating. And if you're always innovating, you know, and you're a problem solver, then come at me, bro. <laughs> you know, like, right? It's like you're going to find a, where there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. All right, Nia. So what are your top three adversities? Embracing the role of CEO and separating my emotions from being a CEO and being misunderstood. I think I'm trying to solve a problem that a lot of people don't understand or see why it is a problem. And so instead they're just attacking the person trying to do something different. Like, oh, you want a box with only black people? You Mm -hmm. shouldn't be doing that. And so being misunderstood has definitely been an adversity. And then the third thing I would say is funding. Like, a lack of funding, Black Lit could be way so further more. than it is yeah. now. So much more if we had um, the proper funding. Yeah, it's not easy, especially how there's no really um, history, right? It's like traditionally banks, they'll look for, you know, some kind of history of some sort or you have a bunch yeah. of assets or, you know, something like that. So access to capital is um for minorities in general it's no secret <laughs> that yeah. is That's hard. <laughs> um and i think it's like it's i think there's also a misunderstanding too i don't know if you feel this as well of like there's one part of getting funding right so like let's say if there's funding that exists but it's the um 
I guess, consistent funding that happens because there's just so much to the business. So like, yeah. like some help is great always, but there's just so much more that is part of building a business. Um, working capital doesn't just mean funds, you know, it's people, you know, like livelihoods. Um, it's a whole shebang. So I, I it's hard I, I want to find a way how we can normalize this conversation, you know, about funding and, and stuff like that, because I think that's very interesting of how society perceives it, how they perceive it when they are helping, and then um, that helping that one time and how to kind of spread the word and how even us as business owners can do better in explaining or being more transparent of our um, situation too, to allow for more of a conversation. I think that would be definitely interesting yeah. well i seen a post on social media by Maddie woodard asking entrepreneurs how, where they got the startup money to start their business okay and it was so interesting seeing all the people say like i got in that as in like inheritance or my family passed it down or i asked my family for a bunch of money and when you don't when generational wealth is about to start with you, you don't have the luxury. <laughs> like that's the easiest way I can put it. Like if you're the first, you are the first. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people don't don't realize that running a business is not free. Generational wealth, it's a thing, you know? Yeah. And it's it's something that a lot of people need to either catch up with or, you know, whatever it is and that's a real thing. Oh my gosh, Nia, thank you so much for bringing that up because gosh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think a lot awesome. of conversation is going to come up from that one. <laughs> More conversation definitely is needed. Yeah. So going into about space. So I want to talk about physical space and kind of like mental space, but we'll start with physical space first. Um, so where did Black Lit begin? You talked about your apartment, but like when did you have a designated space? Like what was that milestone where you're like, oh shoot, okay, I've outgrown my apartment. What am I going to do? <laughs> and where am I going to go? And okay, what do I need? Like when you were calculating, okay, this is the space I need in order to kind of grow. So Black Lit was ran in my one bedroom apartment. Um, tiny, it was a tiny one too. Um, and we got kicked out by my son, okay? He said, enough is enough, mom. When are the boxes gonna go? And they were just everywhere. Like paper shred was everywhere, jamming up the vacuum. Like it was too much. And I told you I lived on the fourth floor. So going back and forth, it was just like, oh no. like. The, bo the boxes were literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so when I decided to um, go full time with Blacklit, I needed some separation. Like, especially with COVID and having to work from home, it was just like, okay, I need some separation because capacity has been reached. And so I started looking for options and ran across Saltbox, which was like, a game changer for me because as a young female entrepreneur, I was a little nervous to just jump right into getting my own building because of the security aspect, but also the maintenance aspect of it. Right. So I started in Saltbox's smallest warehouse space and I brought everything here and my face was just like, I cannot believe all of this was in my apartment. Like I was just like, well, even like the trip right to the post office and you just like, um, having all those things in one place. And then like right around the corner, you're like, Oh, I can just drop this off. And then realizing how much stuff you actually have. <laughs> I would literally have to take like five trips back to back to the post office because they couldn't uh, offer the next right. And so I came into Saltbox smallest, um, space in, I started moving in to the space. I didn't even get all my stuff in before I was just like, guys, I need to upgrade. We cannot fit like, and so they moved us to the next level up. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I really appreciate appreciate about Saltbox mm -hmm. is that they're able to grow. Like you're able to grow with, Saltbox grows with you. Wrapping up here, success is defined and measured individually, not by society. If you could snap your fingers and be your vision of success under your terms, what would that look like? Do you see yourself working on a beach someday or something like that? 
I would say success for me would be really less about me and more about Black literature having a permanent, consistent space in the public school system. I think ultimately that that's my goal. That is my goal. My favorite part is my little sidekick that like having my son along for the ride the first time he said black lit you guys you would have thought he took his first steps i went off i was like what did you say and he was like black lit i was oh. like oh my goodness oh it's just it's amazing so thank you for bringing that to the world because i think a lot of it would be great to have this more of a normalized conversation you know for a woman to look forward to and you know have that extra strength uh, when everything just feels like it's really great and then like really bad some days and you're like, oh, it's really great. And <laughs> just having something to kind of yeah. like push you through, right? <laughs> having a child and doing this, I'm not going to lie. It probably makes entrepreneurship even harder. But if you go through hard things, you become stronger. Like, I don't know how to explain it. So yeah, it makes going through entrepreneurship harder because I'm a mom, but I also feel a lot stronger because I'm a mom. And so it's, it's double-edged. It's how you look at it. Dear mom watching this, start the business, finish the business, run the business. You are literally somebody's wildest dream come true. And I promise you, your little boy or little girl will be so proud of you. My son was, he was very young when I started this business and he's four now. And it's, I, I can't explain it. I can't even imagine the impact when he gets 14 and he still sees this is running. Oh my gosh, that just like warms my yeah. heart so much. Yeah. Um, do you have any final advice for entrepreneurs that are in your past or current shoes? I would say do it anyway. I can tell you a million reasons why Leah Taylor Clark should have not been considered an entrepreneur or why she should have never started a business or why she should have gave up yesterday, today, like, but do it anyway. Um, yes, entrepreneurship is for you, but it's so much bigger than you. And I think that's the joy in it of just living your dream, but also making someone else's dream come true in the process. Do it anyway, please do it anyway. So what can we look forward to from Blacklit in the near future? In the near future, Blacklit should be coming to a public school near you. The Blacklit bookstore should be opening up and the possibilities are endless. Mm, I love that. <laughs> if you could meet any author, who would it be and why, Nia? It would be the author of The Hate You Give, Angie Thomas. The nerve and the courage that she had to write about an issue such as police brutality in a way that was able to reach ninth and 10th grade boys in my class who never wanted to read a book and who mm -hmm. cried after reading that book. I just, I just want to know what made her do it. Like, I just want to know what made her not stop. I just want to know if she knows the amount of impact that she has because that that was an that was an amazing book. Nia, where can we find and connect with you as the CEO of Blacklit? Instagram, I am Blacklit. Um, please come over and hang out with us. And I am Blacklit.com. You can also find us online if you want to purchase a Blacklit box or simply see what Blacklit is all about. We would love to have you. If you have any questions about um, anything regarding Black Lit or just starting a business. My email inbox is always open. My DMs are always open. And even if I don't get right back to you, I'll get back to you. Nia Taylor Clark, CEO and founder of Black Lit. Thank you so much for being with us today, part of Enroute series. And I am so, so honored to be in your presence and to be able to witness your story firsthand. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it.